All right, let's uh, open our time in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time that you've given us to come together as part of your body to worship you in song and in the studying of your word. Um, Lord, um, we just lift this time up to you, and uh, may, you, uh, may you be praised, Lord. Um, open our hearts and our minds to what you'd have us to learn in this time. Lord, challenge us today to be more like you. Lord, we lift this time up to you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In picking the songs this last week um, for Father's Day, thinking, okay, do we want to sing about our Heavenly Father, or do we want, um, how, what am I going to do? How am I going to choose music? And I ended up thinking about the qualities and things that we look for in men and in our fathers, um, in our spouses. And uh, the first song we're going to sing is uh, what I would look for when I look at fathers, I want him to be leaning on God's everlasting arms so that he can lead us. So if you can stand, please, and join us in singing, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. <clears throat> What a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace of mind, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from next song is only one life to offer our fathers um, I'm just thinking of the my father-in-law who's now gone and also my father they only have one life you all have one life to offer and how are you going to use it by the way I didn't say this to begin with happy Father's Day <laughs> to those men out there we celebrate you only one life to offer Sweet. 
only one life to offer. Take it, dear Lord, I pray. Nothing from Thee withholding. Now will I now obey my Jesus, Thou who has freely given. Thank you, Amy. Um, this next song, um, you may or may not know, but <clears throat> I'd like us to sing it the best, the best we can, or if you know it, please please sing along. Um, daily, one of my daily prayers, and I would say daily, is when I wake up, I ask God to make me the best man I can be, the best husband I can be, the best father, son, um, uncle, job site supervisor that God wants me to be. And in this next song, um, these are people 
God's looking for. And I hope and pray that each of us think about how and what God wants each of us to be. Because he wants the best for us. He's got, he's got a plan. We need to desire to be the best we can be for his glory. Um, please sing with us. Can you please stand? This dying world could use is a willing man of God who dares to go against the grain and works without a pause. Then raise the shield of faith, protecting what is pure, whose love is tough and gentle. serve the Lord. The other thing that we want, another thing I should say, not the other, um, we wish for our husbands and our fathers to be servants. Um, if they're serving Christ, they're definitely going to be looking for opportunities to serve others, and then we are all blessed.
Anyways, uh, it's good to be together today on Father's Day, and uh, I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles, please, to uh, Luke 15. Uh, we're continuing on in Luke, but we're jumping ahead a little bit uh, in, order to, in order to deal with a story that's kind of uh, in keeping with our theme today. But as we take time and uh, as we look into the Word, let's begin uh, with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the beauty of this day. We thank you for your goodness to us and the opportunity to be together as church family. And we thank you for the body of Christ gathered here. And I pray that as we take this time and as we spend it in your word, that you would teach us from it. Help us to be people who honor you, who love you, and who desire to follow you. And as we think of this being uh, Father's Day, I pray for the fathers of our church family that there would be together a strong sense of desire to serve you and to honor you. Help us to be people whose eyes are fixed on Jesus Christ. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior. Amen. Well, it is Father's Day, and uh, I can hardly overemphasize uh, the importance of good fathers, uh, even though the message from some directions seems to be uh, that fathers are unnecessary. We know that Good fathers make a profound difference in the lives of their family. Um, just a, a brief scan of the social damage of fatherlessness shows that kids without fathers present, uh, without fathers present are, are four times more likely to be poor, nine times more likely to drop out of high school, ten times more likely to end up in substance abuse centers, and twenty times more likely to spend time in prison. Ninety percent of the homeless and the runaways are from homes without fathers. And uh, you stop and you consider some of those numbers just in brief, and they're profound. This is the good thing. We know that God is a God who redeems, that he's a father to the fatherless, and that he is a one who uh, puts people in families, as, as it says in Psalm 68. And we're thankful for that. And I know that we have people coming from all sorts of different circumstances. And some of you are profoundly grateful for fathers who have had a very, very meaningful place in your life. Others of you have experienced the damage of fathers who have not honored God. And, and as you have experienced that, we're still thankful for the fact that God is at work and he redeems and he heals. And, and I pray that whichever you are, the person who has had the blessing of a father who has conducted himself in a way that is honoring to God, or the person who has experienced the pains and, of the broken world and, and brokenness particularly as it, lead, as it affects fathers. I pray that you would be someone who is able to turn to the great father, that you would recognize always that the great father is the one in whom we trust. We're thankful though and I think it's, it's always an important thing for us to do this. Even though we recognize the brokenness, we are thankful for and we honor the dads who stay. I think that that is a good thing. We are thankful for and we honor the dads who stay, who do the challenging work of loving and protecting and providing for and working to lead their families through the circumstances and seasons of life. And every man who takes on the big project of fathering will find it a significant challenge at some time or another. Every stage he enters is going to be new to him, and he has to work with the circumstances that he's been given. It's not like there's this four-year cycle where what you can do is you can take all the lessons that you learned from the first kid and get it perfect with the next kid who comes through, because that child is going to be different. And, and if you're intent on being a good dad, you can't say, well, I messed this one up, and that one was a little defective anyways, so I'm going to trade these two for another set and start again. It doesn't work that way if you're intent on being a good dad. You work with what you know, you work with who you've been given, and you make course corrections, your own and theirs, using truth to measure your decisions. This is what it requires to be a dad who honors God. And thankfully, we've been given wisdom and truth from the one who is eternally father when it comes to this business, this challenge, and this project of fathering. 
Now, when we turn to the Word of God, it's not a step-by-step parenting manual. But as we look at and learn from the heart and nature of the Eternal Father, we do have access to wisdom and truth. What he has given us and what he tells us is good and right. And we can pursue it in dependence on the Spirit. So we're back in Luke. And as we're in Luke today, Jesus tells us truth through stories that we call parables. Now remember, parables are what? I gave you a definition last week. Can anybody remember the definition that we use with our Sunday school kids? And feel free to speak out. What is a parable? A parable is... Okay, I heard it coming from a few directions. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's what we understand as we come to the parables of Jesus, that they are earthly stories with heavenly meanings. Today, we're looking at the story of a family, specifically of two sons and a forgiving father. There are other stories that Jesus tells about two sons and a father. This particular one is the parable that I would call the parable of the forgiving father. And and, and I know that you probably have it titled differently in your Bible, but really what this is, is this is the parable of the forgiving father. And it's a family story. And family stories can be messy. And this one is. You know, probably if you if you haven't really thought about it from the level of what this looks like in the here and now, you just kind of think of it as a parable that you've heard all your life and you've heard it with a particular mindset. But if you stop and you think about it on an earthly level and really, really try and invest yourself in what this would have looked like in the years that it unfolded or the months that it unfolded, this would have been a messy family story. And family stories can be messy. But this story points to the Heavenly Father. It points to one who, shows, who himself shows us the ideal Father. And on this Father's Day, in a world that's broken, where families can and will face challenges and struggles, If you're a father, God calls you to be a steady hand at the wheel, eyes fixed on Christ, as you lead your family toward a right goal, toward the right destination. And it's very likely in the course of this project that is fathering that you will experience bumps and curves and potholes on the road that lies ahead of you. And Jesus' story, as he tells it here, is a good story for us because it's not the story of a serene, trouble-free family. It's a picture of the Heavenly Father being father to broken children. It's a picture of the Heavenly Father being an earthly father in broken circumstances. And today I think as we look at this picture of a good earthly father who represents the Heavenly Father, we can also learn something about who we want to be as earthly fathers. Let me read it for you. We begin at verse 11 in chapter 15. It says this, And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And then he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. 
I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes, came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. May the Lord bless this reading of his word. As we come to it, there's this particular story. There's a number of observations that we can make about Jesus' story. And, and as we make them, as I said, today we're going to primarily be focusing a little bit about what we learn about the Father in this story. And, and then out of that, the ideal that is set for us and the example that is set for us by the Father in this story. But as we make the observations, the first one I'm going to make is actually probably one that I'm not supposed to make out loud, at least not in this climate in this day. First observation I'm going to make for you is very simply this. Kids can be horrible. That's the truth of the matter. Kids can be horrible. And maybe, maybe if you're honest with yourself, you remember a time when as a kid you were horrible to your parents. <laughs> I mean, I, I would imagine that many of us at some point in our life have memories of moments that as we take a look back at them now, we think to ourselves, how could I have been like that? Why in the world would I have said that or acted like that or been that blind to the reality of what I was doing? Truth is, kids can be horrible. And I hope that I haven't offended anyone right out of the gate. The fact is, adults can be horrible too. The Bible calls that sin. But it's a useful reality to remember in a world where many would prefer to say that kids are misunderstood rather than horrible. I mean, that's kind of the preference, the default setting, right? We've been well and thoroughly immersed in the philosophy of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And if you don't know that name, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is one of the philosophers and patron saints of the educational system and most child care systems. And he presented the idea that in and of themselves, children are unblemished creatures and that parents should just stand back and stay out of the way and let them be the perpetually wonderful beings that they are. Now, just a side note for those of you who happen to have been trained in a little bit of Rousseau. Rousseau abandoned all five of his children and they died in poverty in orphanages. So he's probably not the best instructor for our present day understanding of children and rearing of children. So just that's something that I don't think the teachers colleges or those who are involved in teaching child welfare talk about very often. That Rousseau abandoned all five of his children and that they died in poverty in orphanages. So anyway, back to this. In Jesus' story, the younger son has reached early adulthood. And now he has greater autonomy and freedom and decision-making power. The father, his father, is no longer going to be the boundary setter, which is part of what a father does when his children are younger. He acts as a boundary setter. He sets boundaries to protect his kids from bad things and bad people outside of those walls as we teach them to be strong in the strength of the Lord. And we set boundaries to protect kids from some of the bad and potentially irreversibly damaging decisions they could make themselves inside of the walls as we teach them the wisdom of God 
and the nourishing spiritual truth of the gospel. Now, this is not to encourage helicopter parenting, but if you show me a father who doesn't set thoughtful, wise boundaries, I will show you a kid who's in trouble. If you show me a father who doesn't set thoughtful, wise boundaries, I will show you a kid who's in trouble. But the fact is this. Boundaries, like the law, and by the way, in Galatians, Paul calls the law a paedagogos. He calls it a child tender. It's for those who are, as he says, in the age of spiritual minority. They're in the spiritual age of minority. The law is a child tender. It's a, it's a boundary setter to keep the kids moving in the right direction. But boundaries, like the law, can be only exterior. They're only an outside protection. And ultimately, there is the reality of what's going on in the human heart. And this son reveals his heart when he says, Give me the share of life that is coming to me. Now, probably as you looked at your Bible, you said, My Bible doesn't say, Give me the share of life that is coming to me. Your Bible might have said something like, Give me the share of property that is coming to me. But the word literally there in the Greek is give me the share of life that is coming to me. And this is a very, very interesting thing to consider. Implicit in the demand is the idea, give me the share of life that is coming to me once you're dead. I can't wait. Now stop and consider the dishonor in those words. He either sees his father's value as only how much stuff he can give to him, or he sees the meaning of his own life as only being found in eating and drinking and satisfying his physical pleasures and desires. That is the sum total for him of what his father means. Now, I'm not sure which is coming through explicitly, but I'm inclined to think that both ideas shape his demand. Either way, what we're getting is not a very complimentary look into this young man's heart. And later, as the story unfolds, when Jesus unfolds, he claps into ruin. It's no coincidence that the son ends up living with and eating with pigs. That's not coincidence. That's commentary. You understand what I'm saying? That's not coincidence that he ends up eating and living with pigs. That's commentary. But the father grants his demand and the father settles the legal inheritance and the son cuts ties and he moves into an unbridled and autonomous life. Quick lesson out of this for all of us who are sitting here listening. Let's not be horrible kids. <laughs> that's, a, that's an easy one. Let's not, be, let's not be horrible kids as we think about what it means to be people who love and care for our parents. But our focus is on the father today. So as we come through here, what do we see then about the father? Well, there's a few things. First thing I'm going to mention is this. As we take a look at what unfolds from that point on after the young son receives autonomy is we see that wise fathers don't enable wrong behavior. In verse 13, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. I, I once had a professor who said to our class, be careful not to make parables walk on all fours. And by that he, he was saying, don't find meaning that Jesus didn't intend. Don't make up meanings that Jesus didn't intend. But we're looking at a story that's being told in a time when fathers had much more legal control than fathers do today. And we're looking at a story about a heavenly father who is in fact the sovereign, the ruler over heaven and earth. So we have to ask, is it significant that he doesn't stop his son? He had it in power to do so. He could have controlled the distribution of his property. 
he had more control over his son in that setting. In fact, Old Testament law is very strong when it comes to parents and rebellious kids. And you're probably aware of that, that for the Old Covenant people of God, there was a tremendous amount of ability on the part of the father to respond with severity to a dishonorable and disrespectful child. But ultimately, this father gives his adult child autonomy and he allows him to go where his heart takes him. And his heart takes him away from the people of God and his heart takes him away from the truth of God as he goes to a far country. The fact that he ends up among the pigs would probably indicate that he has nothing to do with the people of God at this point because you wouldn't have been raising pigs and farming pigs inside of the covenant people of God. And I think he knew the life that his son was headed to. In fact, the older brother's words later on in the story, as he comes back to the house, make it clear that he knew where his brother had been. And my thought is that probably the father had a pretty clear idea before he went and even as he was going as to where his son was ending up. And I know that the father loved his son. That comes through very clearly in the story. But as the son walks away, as his life descends and deteriorates, his father doesn't bail him out. He doesn't protect him from the consequences of his actions as he allows him to continue in them. No one gave him anything. I think that that's useful to consider both on a spiritual level and as earthly fathers. I have seen it before, probably you have too, but there can be a tendency rooted in desperate love for parents to enable their kids' bad behavior by bailing them out during the course of their bad behavior rather than allowing them to face the consequences of their actions and see their need for wisdom and repentance. But the reality is typically enabling sin only allows it to metastasize. Enabling sin typically only allows it to be con become confirmed as sin and to grow inside of the child. Back to the son. The disaster is in full swing and he's on the downward slide long before he sees it. When his life, life, I'm using that word again, estate, his life, when his life is gone, he moves in with the pigs and he lives with the pigs and he eats like a pig. But then it says this, he came to himself. He came to himself. And what it's saying when it says he came to himself is it's saying that his eyes were opened, that he became self-aware, that he finally had an accurate view of self and of circumstances and of his father and of the home that he had left. Because I am sure that like most kids who walk into evil, most kids who walk into brokenness, I am sure that he had developed a whole narrative in his mind that made him the hero in the center of the story. I am sure that as he took a look at things that he was convinced that somehow he was just getting away from that prison and from the dad who had done nothing but spoil his fun. But he came to himself. And as he cam comes to himself, his eyes are opened and he finally has an accurate view of self and of circumstances and of his father and of the home that he had left. Many of you at some point have experienced this move from blindness and the fog of sin to a more accurate reckoning. It's called repentance. And this is what real repentance looks like as we see it unfold in the sun. There's no holding back. There's no rationalizing. There's no bargaining with God. There's no lying to oneself for this son and for spiritual sons and daughters. There's no presumption that the Father owes him. There's no presumption that the Father owes us anything. That's what repentance is. I will arise and go to my Father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. It's good to stop and consider this. We often, as we're 
talking with kids, for instance, we often talk about asking Jesus into our hearts. And that phrase is okay. And, and faith is a child, and the faith understanding of little kids is authentic, and it's saving faith. But let's understand this as adults. Let's understand this with the clarity of adults as we look at the clarity of God's word. Coming to Christ involves real repentance. It involves the true recognition of our own sinfulness before God. And turning from that way to follow Jesus Christ. It involves repentance. This is the proof of the Spirit's saving work in us. And if we have not authentically, sincerely repented. And if we have not changed course. And if we are not Christ followers. Then we have no evidence that we are saved. And this is of first importance. We're called to repentance. But back to the father and, and what the younger son sees in his father as he describes the circumstances of home. Because what he sees in his father is a picture of God and it's an example for good fathers to reach toward. He says this, we're going to just slip back a few sentences to verse 17 again. When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I'll say this as far as what I think this tells us about the good father and then good fathers. Good fathers are generous and good-willed men. The estate, the farm, would have had three kinds of people involved in the work that took place there. There would have been family, and then there would have been the doulas, the family servants who lived there, who were provided with food and clothing and a living, and in many ways were almost an extension of the family. And then there would have been the mystheos, the day laborers. In another time, we would have called those day laborers peasants. They were temporary workers who came to do cash work then went back to their hovels at the end of the day, and they were the poorest by far of the three groups. They were impoverished. They lived hand to mouth normally. In this case, though, it's interesting because as the son looks at the day laborers that work for his dad, the poorest of the poor, he sees that even the day laborers were well provided for by his father. They have more than enough bread. He is a generous man to the extent that his son knew being a hired hand to his father was better than being anywhere else. I think of David's words when he talks about the fact that it's better to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. This is the picture that we have here. This father was a good and generous man so that even the hired hands were better off than the people around them. He might have dishonored his father before, but when his eyes were open, he could see that his father was a very good man. And fathers, we want to model for our kids what it means to be generous and good-willed, working for the good of those around us. Good fathers looking to the example of the good father will show their kids what benevolence and generosity and service look like. So the young man sets out to go home, ready to repent, having repented, and ready to continue to express his repentance, seeing the truth about himself, and admitting the truth about who his father has been in front of him. What he has seen in someone that he might have thought of as miserly and withholding before. As the story continues, it's interesting because then it takes what Jesus' audience would have thought was an unacceptable and shameful twist. We read it, and as we read it in light of the 21st century mindset, we look at it and say, well, that's, yeah, we understand what's going on here. But the fact is, this story, as Jesus was telling it, 
was a story that at that point was actually going to offend his listeners. He was portraying the God that they claimed to worship in a way that they couldn't have imagined. And as he does so, it tells us something about the Heavenly Father that we want to be true about us as earthly fathers. And that is this. Good fathers are gracious and sacrificial men. Good fathers are gracious and sacrificial men. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now the religious leaders listening to the story would probably have been happiest when the son was sitting among the pigs. They would have thought he's getting what he deserves as a sinner. And as the story is unfolding, they're possibly thinking as he gets ready to head home that it's going to get even better from their perspective. Because you see, they know that when he arrives home as someone who had wasted his father's estate among the Gentiles, as someone who had lived with the pigs, they know that he's going to face Kazaza. That's not a nonsense word. Kazaza was a community act of condemnation for the disgraced son. The rabbis had constructed a response to a circumstance like this one or a situation where a son shamed his family by marrying a woman that they considered beneath him. The two, the two characteristics of Kazaza are this, or the two uh, criterion for Kazaza are this. One, you have lost your property among the Gentiles. Two, you have married a woman who is not worthy of your family. And when Kazaza took place, this is what happened. He would be met by the whole village carrying a clay pot full of fruit. They would walk up to him and they would smash the pot at his feet and they would declare Josiah or Zedekiah or whatever his name was, Josiah Kazaza. You are cut off from your family who you have shamed. That is what happened when a son who had lost his property among the Gentiles returned home. A pot was smashed at his feet and the community said, you are cut off from your family who you have shamed. That may be part of the reason why the son thought that he should beg to be a day laborer. He knew he didn't stand a chance of being a son. He was Kazaza. He was cut off from his family whom he had shamed. But before this could happen, before the son reaches the village, the father pulls up his robes and he goes running. And the Pharisees are offended by the disgraceful turn of this story because Jewish elders of means and quality never ran. There was a lack of dignity to running. And robes hitched up would mean the shame of legs showing. This was a disrespectful thing that Jesus was saying. But this father was determined to run and get to his son before the community arrived there. And he was determined to make sure that the robe of a guest of honor was put on his son before the community had the chance to mutter its condemnation of that son. A good father reaches out and he strives to restore. And he sets aside his dignity to protect and to redeem his son. And because this is a picture of God the Father we know it's also a picture of Jesus who set aside his glory to protect us, who set aside his glory to die for us on the cross. And it's a useful reminder on Father's Day that good fathers, men of honor, will sacrifice themselves, will give themselves for the good of their children, 
to bring their children to blessing. Which is very different than enabling your child to continue in sin and brokenness. This is not enablement. This is a sacrifice made of dignity, of reputation, of whatever is necessary to bring children to blessing. And the father celebrates when his child returns to where he should be because the son who had lost what he thought was life, is now truly alive. The son who had lost his old material life now has true life, real life. Of course, as we finish the story, we know there's another son. And as we finish the story, we might call this last section, Kids Can Be Horrible Part 2. A good part of Jesus' audience were just like the older brother Jesus talks about next. They were waiting for the younger son to get what he deserved. And the older brother is furious that there's a celebration being held. Maybe he's worried about what this is going to do to his inheritance. Is he all of a sudden going to go from being a two-thirds owner of the property, which is what he would have been, Older son, two-thirds. Younger son, one-third. Is he going to now have to take that two-thirds and divide it once again so that he becomes two-thirds minus a third of the two-thirds? Maybe that's what's going on in his brain. But certainly he's bitter. And he feels ripped off that he's not being properly appreciated for having been the one who did the right thing all through the years. Either way, as we take a look at it, he's angry at the Father's act of grace and how readily he forgives. This is not a guy who rejoices with those who rejoice and weeps with those who weeps. This is a guy who maybe rejoices a little bit with those who are weeping. Says, good on him. He gets what he deserves. That's the way that the older son thinks. And so he's angry enough to speak to his father with disrespect when his father doesn't do what he thinks he should do. But as we watch, we get yet another lesson in fathering. And he, the father, said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. So on the legal end, You're going to get the two-thirds. You can be certain of that. You are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. I think this final lesson that we take from here is that father, this father shows deep patience as he seeks to reconcile with his son to help him to see the truth and to encourage him to reconcile with his brother. I think we see in the character of the father the importance of patience and the importance of fathers working to bring peace among the kids of the family. To simply be someone who stands in and does the work necessary to protect the well-being of the family. I know ultimately that the lesson of the parable is that God accepts anyone who comes to him in genuine repentance. That's what the lesson is. He accepts anyone who comes to him in genuine repentance, whether they were a sinner with a bad past or a sinner with what they thought was a pretty good past. And please notice what I just said. Whether they are a sinner with a bad past or a sinner who thought that they had a pretty good past. Because the problem for the older son was the fact that he didn't realize that he still was a sinner. Receiving what he didn't deserve from a father who owned everything and who loved him. And this is incredibly important for us because this is a warning to the pious. It's a warning to religious people in in Jesus' audience, but also it's a warning to us as the religious, to those who might be tempted to think their own righteousness is what saves them. If we 
have received the goodness and blessing of God. It is not because of who we are or because of what we have done. If we have received the goodness and blessing of God's salvation, it is because we have trusted the one who sacrificed himself to pay for our sin. We have repented, we have acknowledged our need, and we have trusted completely in the work and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's nothing to do with us. But back to the Father. As the nature of the Heavenly Father shows through here, there's an example for us as earthly fathers. And I'll say it this way. If you're an honorable man, and if you are committed to being a good father, you must make a commitment to patience and to the long term. You have to make a commitment to patience. When I think of 1 Corinthians 13 as it defines love, it starts out this way. You probably remember these words because there's this, this, this long definition of the characteristics of love. And what's the very first one? Love is patient. Love is patient. And I think of the importance of patience and I think of it particularly if you tend to be kind of a I want to fix it now sort of person. And there's plenty of men who are that way. I want to fix it now and if it doesn't fix it now I'm just going to toss it aside. And I think that as we take a look here and we see this father as he responds to the son who is disrespectful, who dishonors him, he extends to him a patience and a graciousness that even this son does not deserve. And as he does so, as he does so, then he tries to help him to understand the joy in that moment course as we take a look at this as we walk through the challenges of being dads who lead our children toward Christ as we walk through the challenge of being dads who lead our children toward the highest and best that is who Jesus Christ is the highest and best the name above all names this is essential to our task now none of us are or will be the ideal father I hate to break it to you, although I imagine most of you have figured it out by now. None of us are or will be the ideal father. Ideal fathers usually die at age 28 or so. After that, they all of a sudden start to realize they're no longer parenting experts. None of us are the ideal father. I don't say that as a cheap and easy way to slide out from under responsibility. I just say it as a self-aware admission of reality. There are lots of times that I wish that I'd done things differently. And there are lots of lessons that I've learned after the fact. But we do have an ideal father to look to and to learn from. And we do have his word and his spirit to guide us and to correct our course and to show us where we need to look. And by his grace in dependence on him, I pray that we get there. By his grace, in dependence on him, I pray that we will be men who keep our eyes fixed on Christ and who consider the example of the Heavenly Father as we look to be earthly fathers. Happy Father's Day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. And even as we read these words and reflect on them, as we consider what they show about your heart toward us as your children, broken and wayward, too many times off course, whether we're off course as legalists or whether we're off course as people who have gone in a completely self-destructive direction, we have experienced your grace. You have shown it to us again and again. We have known your patience. We have seen your generosity and your goodwill. We have been people who have experienced your reconciling and restoring work. And I pray as we look at you that this would be who we want to be as fathers. May we look at your example 
your ideal. And may we be people who fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. And may we walk forward seeking to do the project and take on the challenge that you've put in front of us as dads to be dads who show something of the great Heavenly Father to our kids. Thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for life that comes through your son. Thank you for being the ideal in front of us, the one who shows us what is good and true and just and wise and what ultimately points us to redemption, the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your goodness and kindness to us. And I pray as we leave from here today that you would dismiss us with your blessing. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing together. We're going to sing the doxology. I think it's, a, it's, it's a, always a good and fitting thing to sing to the glory of God at the end of all of this. One of the things that I'm aware of as we come together for Father's Day that is that we, we want to honor fathers, but ultimately we understand, we understand that our, the glory goes to God. And we desire to be people who live to the glory of God even as we recognize his provision of good gifts to us. So let's sing together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace both now and forever. Amen. <laughs>